All right, so John 7:32 to 52 will be answering the question, who is Christ? Who is he? Don't take that question for granted. It is one of the most uh, important questions we can ever ask ourselves. Uh, who is Christ? And here's why. Uh, forgot my clicker. Hold on. I was holding you in dispense. Here's why. Dot, dot, dot. Here's why. It, this is the most important question you can ask yourself, who is Christ? Uh, because it's really the question of John. It's the question he's answering. Every single word uh, John says in John 20, verse 31 is written to answer the question, who is Christ, so that we may believe in him. That's what he says. John 20, verse 31. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Okay, so if you just truly believe in who Jesus is, that is, he is the Christ. He is the Son of God. He is this Messiah figure, an anointed one, uh, the king of the universe of our life. You'll have life in his name. You'll never taste death because he came uh, to die the death in our place for our sins, to become sin for us, to live the perfect life in our place. Um, and so what gives us this life in his name, faith. He says, uh, we are to believe that Jesus is the Christ so that we might have life in his, his name. And so in John, we've been looking at how really behind every chapter is this application of belief. Will you just believe? That's really what God wants because upon believing, God changes you. Belief is not just applicational, but transformational when you believe in Christ and when you know who he is. Now we're not to just have faith in faith, that doesn't change you. We're to have faith in Jesus. Even if you have a minuscule amount of faith, uh, we have faith in our big God and who Jesus is and he transforms you. Um, but the main issue is who, who is Jesus that we may believe in. We're to, we're to have life in his name as John 20 verse 31 says and that, that means we, we've got to know his name. We've got to know him personally. And so we'll be um, trying to identify Jesus more personally this morning. Let's pray that God helps us. Let's pray. Father, we just ask that you would help us to uh, know Jesus um, in a sense from afar uh, as he reigns in heaven, but so near to us as he sends his Holy Spirit. Help us to receive your word today, um, our God, as not merely words uh, on a page, but the way that you communicate with us. And, and so give us ears to hear uh, your special voice um, through uh, your letter written to us on the life of Christ. Help us to love him, and in Jesus' name, I pray, amen. So verse 32, um, John writes, the Pharisees heard the crowd muttering about these things, these things that would be in context the different opinions on Jesus and who he is about him. And so the chief priests and the Pharisees sent officers to arrest him. Okay, so the crowd is muttering. That word muttering means there's this whispering. There's all of this dialogue um, among this crowd about who is Jesus. And there's different opinions on who he is, uh, but the religious leaders don't like this. And so they sent, send officers to arrest him. They don't like people talking seriously about Jesus. Um, I can't help but relate to this. When you, when you start talking seriously about Jesus, People don't like that. You can, you can use Jesus as a slang or a cuss word, but not as a real word. Uh, as soon as you use him as a real word, it makes people very uncomfortable uh, to the point where here, uh, officers are sent to arrest him. It could honestly be true of you, of me. It is true in other countries. People are arrested for speaking the name of Jesus, seriously. So in verse 33, Jesus responds to these officers uh, seeking to arrest him. And he said, I will be with you a little longer and then I'm going to be with, uh, going to him who sent me. Uh, so Jesus is really saying, you have no power over me to arrest me. Uh, I'll be with you a little bit longer, just as long as I want to be. And then I'm going uh, to my father, essentially. I'll be with you a little longer, uh, is speaking of that point up to his death and then his ascension uh, to his father, uh, to him who sent me. Uh, so where does he actually refer to? He's really referring to heaven. 
um, he's referring to heaven, but I love how he refers to heaven. It is all about the Father, right? Uh, Jesus was not focused on the place so much as the person, as the person. He's going back to his Father who sent him. And, and in verse 34, he continues, you will seek me and, and you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. Uh, Jesus is telling his enemies, you can be sure of this, if you're seeking to arrest me, you're certainly not going to uh, uh, be following after me uh, to, to my father's place. Uh, but, but take a good look at verse 34 for yourself, and I want you to make sure that you're not in this category. This is one of those verses that you, you need to be sure you're not in this category. Uh, I hope that none of us are in this category. I pray that you are not in this category where Jesus would say of you, you will seek me, but you will not find me. You will not find me. Now, this is a peculiar statement to me, and it took me a while to try to get the hang of what Jesus is saying, because isn't Jesus the one who said, seek and you will find? But now he's saying, you will seek me, you will not find me. Why? I think it's because they will not seek him genuinely. They will seek him, but not find him because they're, they're seeking him for the wrong reason. There is a faulty way of seeking Christ. In the deceitfulness of a heart, we might think we're seeking Christ, uh, but we're not seeking him as the Christ or as our God. Um, they'll be seeking him on earth, but they won't be seeking him in heaven because they, they don't believe that he's from there or going back there. And I think we can make the same mistake too. Seeking Jesus in an earthly way, not realizing that he's in heaven. Uh, I think Colossians uh, 3, 2, uh, or 1 to 2 says it well, reminds us how we ought, we ought to be seeking Christ. It says, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that, on, that are on earth. We seek Christ knowing that he is reigning in heaven. And so, again, look at the end of uh, verse 34. Jesus says, where I am, you cannot come. You cannot come. You will not be able to come to where I am reigning in this place called heaven, which is to say not all people will go to heaven. If you're in this category, you're not going to heaven. Never assume that you're going to heaven. Don't assume that you're going to heaven. Know for sure if you're going to heaven. Don't bet on going to heaven. Um, know for sure if you are. And, and the way that we know if we are is if we know God, if we know Christ. And so do you know God and, and do you believe in Christ is the big question. If so, then you can reverse thir verse 34 to, to, to be saying where I am going, uh, you, you will be going too. You will be with me. John 4, 1, 14, 1 to 3, Jesus says this to his disciples. He says, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe, so, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will make you, uh, take you to myself and where I am, you may be also. And so you see, that's a reversal of what he tells this different crowd. Uh, they're a religious crowd, by the way. So they would have been saying, I'm going to heaven. But he's saying, no, you're not. I'm going there and you won't follow after me. But that can be reversed if you believe in Christ, truly. And you, and you, you can be able to say, uh, where Jesus is going, I am coming too. Um, or verse 33, you could say, uh, like Christ, I will be with you a little longer than I'm going to him who sent me. Uh, that describes death, by the way. I will be here on earth a little bit longer, and then I'm going to my Father. That describes death for the Christian who's identified with Christ and his words here. Uh, we are departing from this earth. Death is a homecoming. Uh, death is going back to our Father who made us. And hopefully that takes the dread out of death uh, for, for some of you, uh, for all of you, uh, because it's a home going, it's a homecoming. Um, death is, for the Christian, uh, more of a mirage uh, than it is a reality because Christ has tasted death for us. We go to be with him. Now in verses uh, 35 to 36, Jesus' Jewish audience doesn't, understand what Jesus is saying. And so they basically reply with, huh, where? Uh, so listen to what they say. The Jews said to one another, where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? 
Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What does he mean by saying, you will seek me and you will not find me and where I am, you cannot come? Um, they cannot understand Christ's words. They do not understand uh, the heavenly status of Jesus. And until we understand the heavenly status of Jesus, the, the deity of Jesus, we will not understand any of his words or go to be with him. So they don't understand where he is. They don't understand who he is. Uh, I would say in order to understand who Jesus is, we do need to understand where he is. We need to know his address if we know him. His address is in heaven. Hebrews 8.1 says, We have uh, such a high priest, one who is seated in, at, at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. Our, our Christ, our Savior, is ruling in heaven. That's where he is. And we know him. Now, when Jesus ascended to heaven, he descended something upon those who believed in his name. That is the Holy Spirit, right? His very presence to be with us. And so in verses 37 to 39, uh, we'll, we'll make that type of switch. Maybe that was in John's mind as he's writing this. And, and so verse 37 begins now on the last day of the feast. Now, remember uh, the context here. Uh, chapter 7 has been going on during the Feast of Booths. Uh, verse 2 introduced that fact to us. It was the Feast of Booths. It was at hand. Now, this was a feast, remember, that was seven days long. It was uh, considered one of the greatest feasts, if not the greatest throughout the year. It was the most well-attended where Jews would travel from everywhere just to be here. It was a camping feast. It was a camping type of holiday where they would make uh, these tents out of leafy greens, and they would tent for a week commemorating how God had redeemed them from Egypt to, to uh, bring them into the wilderness where they would camp, essentially, move around in tents for 40 years. But he provided for them with water from a rock uh, through the staff of Moses and through uh, this pillar of fire to lead them, representing the presence of God. And so uh, there, as a nation, this tradition, this this festival would preserve that historical fact, I think, to show actually that it really did happen. This nation had a, a legitimately like a 4th of July celebration uh, that we have to celebrate what actually occurred, uh, although this was the Feast of Booths, the Feast of uh, Tabernacles. So during this festival, they would do two things. They would light up the city of Jerusalem uh, to commemorate Christ leading them in the wilderness by fire, and then also they would have a water rite where they would draw water from the pool of Bethsaida, I believe. And so it's no coincidence that Jesus is gonna pull from that, those traditions, and he'll go on to say, I'm the living, whoever believes in me will receive living water. Uh, I'm the rock from which living water flows that keeps you alive in this wilderness of life. I'm the fulfillment to that ritual, essentially he's saying. I'm the heart and meaning behind this ritual. And so he cries out in 37 at this, in the last day of the feast. So this is important. He is shouting this at the top of his lungs. He's preaching it. And so it's very important that we catch it. He says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Uh, I want to break down this two sentence sermon of Jesus into two points. You have the invitation and you have the transformation. You have the invitation and the transformation. Um, first, let's look at the invitation. And I think Ray Pritchard just does a good summary of this. Um, and so let me, let me read this. He says, this short statement contains the essence of the gospel message. It is centered in a person, Jesus Christ. It is offered to all without restriction, if anyone. It is predicated upon human need, if anyone is thirsty. It demands a personal response. Let him come to me. It invites personal participation and drink. That's how Ray Pritchard breaks it down, uh, but let's break it down together now. First of all, you have the extent. He says, if anyone is thirsty, anyone, that means anyone. That means you, that means me, that means people in Africa or Asia or Australia and everyone. This invite is to everyone. Uh, and then there's the requirement, there is the requirement of if anyone thirsts. Now, thirst for what? 
I think Jesus' words in Matthew 5, 6 describes what kind of thirst this is that would come to Jesus. He says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. We hunger, we thirst for righteousness. We, we thirst for forgiveness. This invitation is for people who understand they're guilty. Um, they're not right. We thirst for God and peace with him. Um, now, thirst, when you think of it, is a gift. Have you ever thought of it as a gift? It's a gift. If you didn't thirst, you would die if you, or you would be dead. Uh, thirst is, is a good thing. And so it's crucial that we're thirsty. Or it's, thir it's crucial that you're thirsty um, in order to believe in Christ. If we aren't thirsty, we're dead. And so I want you to think of it like this. We're alive in our need. We are actually alive in our need. Thirst is a good thing. Uh, but not only is thirst a sign of life, it's a, might, it's a mighty motivator too. If you, are, if you are thirsty, I mean really thirsty, uh, nothing will satisfy you except pure, singular water. I don't want it flavored. Uh, I don't want uh, it, it to have run through coffee grounds or been seeped in tea leaves. I want water, right? If you're thirsty and, and you know, starving for water in the desert, you're not thinking, oh, I need, I need coffee. I need tea. <laughs> I need some soda. No, you're thinking, just give me water. Just give me water. Um, and that will be your singular thought. If you're thirsty, you can't even enjoy, enjoy food. Did you know that? You can't even eat food. Uh, thirst, I think, actually surpasses our, our hunger. I'll go through poison ivy. I'll go through witch hazel. I'll go through uh, a ground filled with hot coals if it means I can quench my thirst. Um, otherwise, I die. I'll scorch my feet. I need water. And so I'm just trying to illustrate how, how mighty of a motivator thirst is. And, and it's, it's just for one thing, water. Okay, and this describes the essence of the gospel. We, for, we thirst for just one person, Jesus. That's salvation. That's heaven for you. Only Jesus. Uh, so Jesus says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He is our singular source of satisfaction and eternal, eternal satisfaction. In fact, he is our need. I like how the psalmist says it in Psalm 42, 1 to 2. He says it like this, as a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you. Oh God, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. We thirst for him. That's what type of thirst we need. And so Jesus says in verse 38, whoever believes in me, it's, it's him. Um, now I want you to consider the commands that Jesus gives us here to describe uh, life granting satisfaction. The different commands are thirst, or I'm sorry, it's not really a, a command. It's more of a... Uh, a need, but come, drink, believe. He says, come, drink, believe. Those are three things that we need to do, kind of all a part of one package. First action is come to Jesus. The second ac action is, okay, okay, drink from him. Now, I think when you separate the two, uh, coming to Jesus but not drinking from him, you describe a whole lot of professing Christians. Coming to Jesus, so close, you've seen him. Uh, maybe you come to church and you've, you drink communion, but you haven't drank from Christ. There's a difference. You've drank from the rituals. You've drank uh, from your devotionals, but you haven't drank from Christ. When we come to Christ, we need to drink from Christ. We need him to give us something vital for our soul uh, that, that, that keeps us alive forever. And so we, we drink. You need to drink. Notice what Jesus doesn't say. He doesn't say, come to me and buy, come to me and work, come to me and give yourself to me. He says, come to me and drink, receive. This is the gospel. This is the good news that we are to receive by grace through faith, Jesus, as the one who dies for our sins, who resurrected for our life. We are just to receive. And uh, verse 38 sums it all up by saying, we believe in him. 
Belief, and that, that means what is saving true belief in Christ? It is thirsting and coming to him. It's coming to him and then drinking from him. That is saving belief. It's, it's active. There is something to it. Um, we come and drink. And it's simple. I, you know, you don't have to complicate this, right? Uh, my kids all the time ask my wife and I for water. Like, they, they whine for water. And guess what? We give them water. Uh, we give them a drink. Kids know this. Even babies are born with an ability to drink, right? I like what First Peter 2, 2 to 4 says, like newborn infants crave pure spiritual milk, if indeed you have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. This is simple. Drinking uh, and thirsting is a sign of life. Do you have that sign of life? Uh, it is what brings us to Jesus. Are we are we thirsty? It's vital. Now, notice the transformation that occurs once you come to Jesus. We drink from Jesus. Verse 38 says, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And so it's like you go from taking a drink to becoming a drink for others. And uh, by the way, Jesus says, as the scripture has said, it probably refers to the sense of many scriptures in the Old Testament, not just one. You can't find like this uh, this sentence verbatim in the Old Testament, but scriptures like Isaiah 12, 3, or 35, 6 to 7, Isaiah 55, uh, get it, the idea of what Jesus is saying, that we need God to moisten up our life, uh, to bring springs out of the desert. Um, so verse 39, it describes how uh, joyous, life-giving transformation happens after you believe. Belief has its effect on us. Belief is not stagnant. It leads to a river flowing through you. Um, and, and Jesus describes in, in verse 39 what happens upon believing in Christ as he, as he says. Now, he said this, or John actually uh, adds this in. He says, now, that he said this about the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the spirit had not yet been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So listen, we sometimes forget this. Upon believing in Jesus, we receive life-giving Holy Spirit. Um, what a gift. Uh, now this would happen at Pentecost uh, when John says it had not yet been given. He's not saying the Holy Spirit didn't exist from eternity past or in the Old Testament. Uh, it just had not been given to every believer in a unique way. It was um, indwelling leaders or prophets, but not every believer in the Old Testament. So we're very privileged in the day and age where we're living, church. This is the, this is the, the day of grace. Um, so we all experience the Holy Spirit upon believing in Christ. So, it, but it's most important to ask, have I believed in Christ? Have I come, come to him and drank from him? Then we have gone from, again, taking a drink to becoming a drink for others, for others. Um, I think verses 37 to 39 describes the difference between identifying who Jesus is and ide identifying or being identified with Jesus. His life flows through you upon believing in him. And so I want to uh, answer the question, what does verses 38 to 39 look like practically in our life? What could these verses look like? How does it, how does it apply? Well, certainly it's saying that like I said before, faith is not stagnant, it's flowing. Uh, our faith in Christ is transformational. We become this source of this river flowing out of us. And what that means is when we come to Jesus and drink, we become a blessing for others. The Holy Spirit in us is not just for us, but for others through us. And you just imagine this this work of the Holy Spirit in us, and it's staggering. So I want you to play out this scene with me. Uh, again, imagine you're in a desert, all right? Imagine that, uh, far from it, here in the Adirondacks, but imagine you're in a desert and you're thirsty. What's the best thing that could happen to you if you're thirsting for water? Maybe somebody brings you a drink of water, they, they, they offer you a cup, that's good, but that's not as good as stumbling upon a river because the cup runs out, right? The, 
river does not. It's ever flowing. And, and so a stumbling upon a, a stream is, is going to be the best news for thirsty souls because it keeps on flowing. And what Jesus is saying is that not only upon believing in me do you stumble upon a stream or a river, but you become that river for other people who are thirsty souls. This river, river, these rivers flow through you, meaning you have the ability to offer people the satisfaction that you found in Christ. And God wants to use you uh, as a ministry to other people. But remember, it's, it's Holy Spirit fueled. That Holy Spirit is the, is, is the source of those rivers coming out of you. Now, unfortunately, I think the, the, the sad reality is sometimes believers, we believed in Christ, we have these rivers flowing out of us, but we're not pouring ourselves into other people. And, and we don't make that choice. Even though we can be serving other people, we can be sharing with the lost world how they can be satisfied in Christ. We don't. We refuse to. And yet God is saying, you have an ability to pour into other people because I've poured into you the Holy Spirit, which becomes rivers flowing from you. Some people have dead sea faith instead of river faith. We should, we should have river faith. Dead sea faith means... Well, the Dead Sea is the saltiest body of water on planet Earth at the lowest point in the world. And it doesn't go anywhere. From what I understand, it just keeps on getting saltier by the year. We don't want Dead Sea faith uh, that is stagnant like that and just makes people thirst. We don't want to become leeches. We want river faith. River faith is that which moves into and fuels and funds the other bodies of water like lakes and sees. And God is saying upon believing in, in me, in, in Christ, there's this transformation that occurs where the Holy Spirit enters into you and becomes rivers flowing out of you to bless other people, to become a source of blessing to them. And it's all funded by Christ in us and his spirit in us. And so verses 38 to 39 describe what a spirit-filled Christian is. We are giving, not taking. We're blessing others. And the effect is, is odd. It's odd enough. Proverbs 11.25 says, Whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and one who waters will himself be watered. That's the Christian life. In watering others, we are watered. We are blessed uh, by blessing others because we have an endless supply of God's spirit of his satisfaction in us. We can give and we can give and we can give and we can never run out. And so proof of a spirit-filled Christian is uh, are you pouring out blessings into other people or just thinking about yourself? God did not just save you for you. He saved you to then make you a vessel in saving and satisfying other people. That is through his Holy Spirit. And so uh, I pray that we as a church are a river, a river church. We have rivers of faith. Um, and you can imagine this so well. The Holy Spirit uh, is overflowing out of our lives and flooding the streets of Warrensburg, the hallways of the school, uh, maybe the cubicles of your workplace, uh, wherever it is. Uh, God wants to be a blessing through you. We aren't just walking in good works. Uh, but the Holy Spirit is flowing through you with good works and good deeds and with good intentions, the right intentions behind it because it's out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And I want you to notice the, ex the extent of this. I thought this was special as I was studying this. I noticed it isn't just a river that flows out of us, but it's rivers flowing out of us. You think about that and rivers, you know, they jut out into different directions. We have the Scroon River that runs by our town and through our town, and it, it turns into the Hudson River, which just gets bigger and bigger, which eventually it makes it all, it, it, all its way uh, down to New York City. And that describes the, the type of transformation that God does through our life upon believing in Christ. The effect, the profound effect of your faith in Christ as you're pouring yourself out into other people can make its way all the way downtown and into the cities and into other towns. Really, we have no clue. We don't know all of the 
all of the dynamics of where the river goes, but God is pouring out this, these rivers through us in every direction of the world through his Holy Spirit. And essentially that is why the, God has his church in every location on planet earth, because this really happened in the disciples' lives as they became rivers upon the Holy Spirit indwelling them and they preached the word and literally it spread across the world. And that's because God has given us his Holy Spirit. And so don't put a dam in the way of that work of the Holy Spirit, potentially by thinking that it's you and not him. We can get in the way, I think, of God's, of God's work. Um, now, I want, want to give you a test. Um, how do we know that the Holy Spirit is in us practically? How do other people see the powerful work of this Holy Spirit in us? I would, I would propose that it happens when God dries up the life around us, when he even shrivels up our life and we become this, this dry pot with cracks and aches and pains and nothing's going right. That will show to other people that there is this river flowing out, us, that, that out of us, that even though physically there is nothing moist and lush about our life, the joy of the Lord continues to flow because it's from the Holy Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit continually bud and grow even though life around us is dry. And the unsaved will see that and say, it's not of this world. It's not of that person, but it's of something or somebody else. Isn't it true, flowing water means a whole lot more in a desert than in a rainforest. And God will dry up our circumstances so that people can see this water flowing, uh, the work of the Holy Spirit in our life, and so that we can see it too. Now something uh, that happens often today in ministry is something called burnout, right? Have you heard of that or felt it? Uh, maybe, maybe in your service towards others, you're burned out. Another way of describing that is drying up. I feel dry. How many of you have felt dry before? Uh, maybe spiritually, you're like, I'm dry. I just wanna remind you that you're not dry. You feel dry. If by faith we believe that this is true, that upon believing in Christ, he fills us with this Holy Spirit and rivers of satisfaction flow from us, it means the way you feel is just not the fact. You feel dry and that's okay, but we aren't dry. We don't run out of God's sustenance through us. We're not dry because out of your heart will flow rivers of living water. It's still flowing and it will always flow. It's important to believe that so that you don't fall under the impression of a lie. I feel dry, so I am dry. You're not. You have all that you have in Christ and that never changes. It never changes. I think burnout or feeling dry, drying up might happen when we're ministering on our own resources but not depending on the spirit, that the Spirit's work through us. What does that look like? Honestly, I think it looks like something very simple. Admitting and acknowledging that I don't have strength within me or the power or resources within me, I mean, me, myself, and I, to minister to other people or to help them. But I pray, God help me because you've put a spring inside of me and flow out of me. It, I think it's as simple as just trusting in him and depending on him and recognizing it can't be me, it must be him. Now the question is, how is this crowd going to respond to Jesus and his great words of invitation at this religious feast? Well, in verse 40 to the end, we have a mixed, uh, mixed responses, mixed feelings. And so let's look at them together. Verse 40, uh, some say this really is the prophet. Now they're speaking of Moses. And in Deuteronomy 18, 15, he describes of this prophet that will rise after him that will be greater than him. It's a prophecy of this greater prophet than Moses. And they're connecting Christ and possibly his claim to, to giving flowing water uh, to Moses. Maybe Moses, when he struck the rock and water came out and they're, they're, they're seeing a connection in scripture to see that perhaps this is the guy that scripture talks about that we are to listen to. But the bottom line is that they are trying to identify Jesus by scripture, by scripture. The prophet is directly linked to Deuteronomy 18. And it's a good example for us. If we know Christ, we need to know him through the witness of scripture, lest we just 
believe in an imaginary figure without credibility. Uh, but others say in verse 41, this is the Christ. Now that's a scriptural title too. It means the anointed one, this king figure. And the Old Testament is just speckled with tons of referencing to this Christ who will come and save the world. Um, now verses 40 and 41 uh, see, seem to hint at how these people think that these were two different figures, the Christ and the prophet. They didn't know. Uh, they were a little confused on completely trying to piece all of the pieces of scripture together and identify Christ. Maybe that's you. You know, I'm trying to piece together how or who Christ is through the grand scheme of the Bible, the, from front to cover or cover to back. Uh, how, how, who is Christ according to scripture? And I'm telling you, that is the most important question. Identifying Christ through scripture because we have absolutely no clue who he is. Um, or it's just a clue, uh, but not a fact if we don't identify him through scripture. It's vital. Um, so who is Christ according to the witness of scriptures? That's what these Jewish folks are trying to arrive to. But in verses 41 to 42, we see people are misinformed. They continue to try to piece together uh, this identity of Jesus through the collage of scriptures. As others said, this is the Christ, but some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? Okay, so people are misinformed about Christ's identity. They're quoting Micah 5.2. Uh, Jesus, uh, this Christ figure, uh, was to be Davidic and to come from Bethlehem. Uh, but they don't know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. They're saying, I thought he's from Galilee. I don't know where he was born. Um, so there's confusion here. Uh, there's confusion here. Maybe it's because, you know, Jesus was born in Bethlehem on a trip during a census. His, his parents uh, raised him in the Galilee region, north of Bethlehem. Bethlehem is in uh, Jerusalem area. And so it's understandable how they would have been a little bit confused. Uh, but it's interesting how really if they would have done a little bit of research, they could have understand who this Jesus is. He is from Bethlehem. He was born there. If they did a little bit of research, they could have understood that Jesus is the fulfillment of that scripture. I think that's a, this, is re, this represents a whole category of people. They know scriptures about Jesus, but they don't know Jesus. They don't know him personally. They don't know where he's from. And they neglect to do just a little bit of research to discover who he is. Read the case for Christ. Uh, Watch the case for Christ, that movie, or read the Bible, which is our case for Christ. And you will discover that Jesus is the Christ, the King of the world, our God of the world. Um, but this crowd, at least at this point, they don't get that far. So in verses uh, 43 to 44, there's division that's arising among uh, the people. And it says, some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. Nobody laid hands on him because of uh, the crowd that has all of these different opinions on Jesus' identity. Basically, these uh, officers, remember, who were sent to arrest Jesus now won't arrest him because they're afraid of a riot. Remember, this is the most well-attended festival of the whole year. There were tons of people. So um, in verse 45, you're going to see the officers go back to their superiors who sent them, the chief priests and the Pharisees. And they're going to have to explain to them why they didn't arrest Jesus. Verses 45 to 46 says, The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to, to them, Why did you not bring him? And the officers answered, No one ever spoke like this man. This is one of my favorite answers. Uh, they're saying his words are just special. They're unmistakable. Um, I think verse 46, when talking about the identity of Christ, identifies him. How do you identify Christ? Voice recognition. Nobody speaks like Christ. When you read just the red letters of the Bible, meaning the Gospels, meaning the words in John, I personally believe that you, you can say what these officers say. No one ever spoke like this man. Uh, this is the, the divine word, as John 1.1 1, 1 introduces Jesus, who has words of gold. And as such, he's inspired the Bible, all of the scriptures, which we can say are God's words. 
And there's no words like these words. They're special. They're well written. Um, they're true. They're written, written in a way that it is written genuinely so that uh, if they're not true, it's a book of lies. If Jesus is not speaking truth, uh, then as C.S. Lewis said, he's either a liar, a lunatic, or the son of God. It just doesn't make sense to, uh, to say anything else, okay? And so Jesus' voice, notice it was, it was the way that he spoke that held the people in, in awe. Uh, I have a, a grandfather I talk about a lot on Heather's side, who is a Bible teacher, and we just came from a Bible conference and uh, listened to him. And, and one of, I think, the signature parts of his teaching is his voice. I think he sounds like Mufasa. His voice is so deep and rich, and it just, it draws you in. And, uh, and then I think of Christ. What did he sound like, you know? It, not just, this, just his words that are special, but his voice, the living aspect to his word. And it, it reminds me of the Bible. It's not just the Bible that's special and the words, but the living aspect to his word, the voice of the spirit that speaks through his word to us. And you can say, nobody ever spoke like this book. Nobody ever spoke like this man. And even these officers who were seeking to arrest him recognized that. So uh, the Pharisees answered him um, in verse 47, have you also, uh, have you also been deceived? Um, and so here you have the response of deception. If uh, you believe in the Bible and you believe in Christ's claims and you say he is the son of God, he is God the son, there's no other life apart from him, people will call you crazy if you speak up for that. People will say you've been deceived uh, into a book of lies. People will say you've been bamboozled, <laughs> Linda. <laughs> bamboozled is the word. You've been deceived. People will tell us that. Um, when verses uh, 48 to, to 49, the authorities say, have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Now what they're saying is uh, those in authorities don't believe in this hogwash uh, of Jesus. And so you common people, you don't know any better. You're not the elite. Basically, it's, it's kind of a philosophy of today, right? The intelligent, the, the smart, the, those in high position or with degrees have an accreditation over truth. They don't, right? As Jesus says in John 7, 17, if anybody's will is to believe uh, or will to do God's will, he will know whether... Uh, my teaching is from God or not. And so they're saying, oh, the elite don't buy into any of this. You, 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 know, you don't know anything if you don't have a degree. Well, that's not true. God is for the simple just as much as the smart. Now in verses 50 to 51, Nicodemus enters back into the scene. Do you remember him? In chapter three of John, uh, he entered the scene uh, trying to do some research on Jesus and now he shows up again. He's a religious leader. So he speaks up, Nicodemus, it says, who had gone to him before and who was one of them. Okay, he's a Pharisee. He said to them, does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? And so Nicodemus is saying, hey, don't dismiss Jesus before you at least give him an honest hearing. Um, he says, don't dismiss Jesus before you give him an honest hearing. Now, I love this story of Nicodemus and how it develops because he's coming out of his shell here. When he met Jesus in John 3, it was in secret. Now it's in public. He's coming out of his shell. He's, I, he's not only getting further in seeking to identify who Jesus is, but now he's identifying with Jesus in public. Nicodemus is an example of somebody who experiences the grace of God working slowly in their life. He doesn't totally buy into who Jesus is at first but he's getting there. He's giving him, him, him a, a, a fair shot. And now he's identifying with him. He's risking his reputation as he's speaking up for Jesus. And this is really important because there's a difference between identifying who Jesus is and then identifying with Jesus. Nicodemus is identifying with Jesus here and he gets slandered for it in verse 52. If you identify with Jesus in public and you don't just believe it silently in your heart, but you let the river of your faith flow out of your mouth, in confession of who Christ is to you, you will receive 
some lashback as verse 52 says that Nicodemus's peers say to him, are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. And so uh, I wanna end by thinking about Nicodemus. He's a good figure for us. He's slowly coming towards Christ. All of us are, even after we've come to Christ, we're, we're still arriving to more and more of his identity as our eternal one. Um, and Nicodemus is somebody who's on that pathway. And so um, I want to end by, by asking the believers in the room. Most of us, I assume, are believers. We believe in the identity of Christ. Uh, you know who he is. You've come to him. You've drank. If you haven't, drink from him. But what we struggle with is identifying with him like Nicodemus finding our identity in him, as Jesus teaches in verses 37 to 39, where he says, if you believe in me, I'll give you a drink and that drink will come inside of you and flow out of you. We not only need to identify who Jesus is as the Christ, as our savior of the world, but be identified with him knowing that he is in us. And then not to be afraid to speak up to other people and say, hey, will you give Jesus a fair chance? Nicodemus is risking his reputation here with, with his religious leaders by speaking up for Jesus. And you see he receives some lashback, but that's because he's identifying with Jesus. And so I wanna end by asking you, is not only Christ somebody that you've identified in your life to whom you believe in, but have, have you identified with him? And there's a public aspect to that as we see in Nicodemus's life and we're going to see later in John how Nicodemus will uh, actually play a part in burying Jesus because he's not going to depart from Jesus. He's only be going to become more and more convinced and sold out for who Jesus is. And that's what we need, church. Not just people who nod our heads to who Jesus is, but are sold out, who follow him, who identify with him, who speak up about who he is. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that... Uh, you are worth uh, identifying with. In fact, if we were embarrassed about speaking your name uh, in public, uh, then it's questionable whether or not we really love you or not. Um, so God, help us to, to be proud of who you are. And, and for those who might be in a similar situation as Nicodemus here, God, would you um, help them give Jesus a fair, a fair, a fair hearing, God. Um, to give your words a fair hearing. Father, we thank you for your word to us that no one has ever spoken like Christ. He is the best teacher. Um, and as such, we need taught from him. Lest we die, lest we're lost. So thank you for your word to us today. Uh, Father, please just dig it deeply into our heart. Help us to remember your words. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.